Today we continue our series and, you know, nothing worth doing in our lives comes easy. Do you believe that? Those things that God calls us to do, those things that we know God is asking us to do, those things that will outlive our lives, those things that will make a huge impact, those are the things that are sometimes the hardest things to accomplish. And we're in that as a church. These are, these are great days, but they're challenging days. We're in transition. There's all kinds of new things. And, and sometimes it's when we're in the thick of seeing God fulfill a vision that at times the evil one would love to discourage us. Not only as a corporate congregation, but also in our personal lives. I'm sure if we went around uh, the theater this morning, many of you would have stories of discouragement. Times where in your journey, and maybe you're in one of those seasons right now. What is discouragement? To be discouraged means to lose confidence, to maybe lose enthusiasm, or, or perhaps we're demoralized, or we're in despair, or we're disheartened or dismayed. Any of us ever feel that way? No. One of the ways to stay emotionally healthy is to admit that. Any of you at times have bouts of discouragement? Honestly, I think we all do. We all have bouts of discouragement. And in fact, I think it's one of the greatest weapons of the evil one to get us off the rails, to get us distracted, to, to get us disheartened, to, to get us to a place where some of us even will doubt God and His existence. Discouragement at times can literally take the carpet right behind or underneath our feet and get us flat on our faces and our backs. Discouragement is a real deal, and, and perhaps you walked into this place and you're feeling discouragement, and, and, and there are reasons that sometimes uh, cause us to be discouraged, and I want to talk about four of those reasons, and one of the top reasons at times in our lives where we, we face discouragement is we're discouraged with our relationships in our lives. Relationships, God created us to be relational beings. He wired us to be in community. Now, we all have different personality types, so the way we express that is differently. But God hardwired us with the need of relationship in our lives. And so when those relationships go through seasons of stress or seasons of brokenness or disappointment, discouragement can flood our lives. And maybe today you've come and and you have discouragement because your marital relationship is really struggling. Or perhaps you're single and and perhaps you were dating or you had a relationship, you thought the future was bright there and it hasn't worked out the way you thought it would work. And and discouragement is right there at the door knocking. Or perhaps it's with a child. Your son, your daughter is making decisions in their journey that, that, that you wish they would not make and it's caused all kinds of discouragement in your life. Maybe students... It's, it's relationships, it's friends, and you thought certain people would be there or back you, and they've walked away when you needed the most. And so relationships can bring all kinds of discouragement in our life. An Older Testament gen- gentleman by the name of Job, Job experienced great discouragement in his life because of his uh, marital relationship and his friendships in his life. You see, Job lost everything. He lost his health. He lost his resources. He was a wealthy man. He lost it all. And then his wife, in the middle of all of it, while Job is trying to be faithful to the Lord, he's righteous, he's upright, he's not going to turn his back on God when things are going bad. And so he's, he's doing his best to not allow discouragement to take over. But then his wife says to him in the heat of his, his battle, are you still maintaining your integrity? Curse God and die. And he looks at her and he says, you are talking like a foolish woman. Shall we accept good from God and not trouble? And so here's this relational tension in Job's life that is creating discouragement in his life. In fact, many of the chapters in Job, you see him uh, desperately exposing his heart to God. And in chapter 2, he says, May the day of my birth 
perish. And the night that said, a boy is conceived, may that day, may it turn to darkness. May God above all not care about it. May no light shine on that day. See, Job, he went on chapters and chapters, if you read the book of Job, of, of, of his discontent and of his discouragement. And God is standing on the sideline of his life and he listens to him. He's letting Job express all of his emotions. And then it's time for God to speak. And for two or three chapters in the later part of of Job's story, God says, Job, do you have anything to do with the creation of the universe? Do you have anything to do with the lightning? Do you have anything to do with the seas and all the creatures of the seas? Do you have anything to do with the animals and how they live and and move uh, on the ground? Do Do you have anything to do with the snow that falls and the rain that falls? Do you have anything to do with the vegetation that grows? And after God just bombards Job with truth, Job's like, oh... My God, I have tried to talk about things in my life that I know nothing about. God, you are sovereign. You are my creator. And so in the midst of his relational tension, in the midst of his discouragement, Job lifts his eyes to the heavens and ensures his life stays intact. His faith stays intact. And as the story goes, God blesses him twofold. And allows him to regain all that he had lost before. Friends, maybe you're in this room today. And part of the source of the discouragement in your life is those relationships in your life that are stressed at the moment. God sees it. He knows every detail of your life. Perhaps another reason why we get discouraged is, is the discouragement that comes with life circumstances. You see, difficult situations in our lives can create high levels of discouragement. Perhaps it's it's related to your employment. And perhaps you're not necessarily feeling like you're performing at a level that your boss expects. And there's tension there. And you know there's meetings coming up. And you're wondering, man, is my job secure? And that can create discouragement in our life. Perhaps you're here and you've been dealing with health challenges. Life circumstances have changed for you because of health. And the things that you used to do without any pain are all of a sudden no longer there. And that has created discouragement in your life. Perhaps it's related to your finances. And you work so hard at trying to get ahead of the game. And it seems like you just can't move forward. And perhaps you're here this morning and the debt load is just snowballing. And it's creating all kinds of discouragement in your life. Perhaps there's disappointments in our life circumstances that creates discouragement in our life. In the Older Testament, there's a man, a prophet by the name of Elijah. Elijah came to a place in his life where he felt his ministry was an absolute waste of time. He goes through this stretch where he just is so discouraged. He's so discouraged. And it's ironic because he had seen God show up in great power in his life. He had battled against the prophets of Baal. And and he, he said to the prophets, let's have a battle and see whose God shows up. And of course, the story goes where the prophets of Baal put the sacrifice and they start crying out to, to, to their God and, and they're saying, come down with fire and, and come on this sacrifice and nothing happens, of course, because their God isn't true, their God isn't alive. And, and Elijah's on the sideline, in a sense, taunting them, saying, hey, maybe he's sleeping today, maybe he's busy today, maybe you're not yelling loud enough. Nothing happens. Now it's Elijah's turn, and he puts the sacrifice, and of course, he wants to make sure they know that his God is living, so he douses the sacrifice with water. He makes sure that they don't know he's made a trick to get this sacrifice to come ablaze, and so he soaks it and soaks it some more, soaks it some more, and then he calls out to our living God, and God shows up, and those prophets realize, wow, The God of Elijah is the true God. And so he should have been amped up, don't you think? He should have been so filled with courage, and yet he walks away from that whole experience, and he hears that Jezebel is after him. 
And, and her men are after him. And so he's on the run for his life. And he finds a broom tree. And he sits under this broom tree, this bush. And the word of the Lord says this. He came to a broom bush, sat down under it, and he prayed that he might die. And he said these words, I have had enough, Lord, he said. Take my life. I'm no better than my ancestors. Wow. Amazing. How quickly Elijah had forgotten of the power of God in his time of discouragement. That can happen to us, can't it? If you look back in your life and you think how often God has revealed himself to be faithful in your life. And yet we go through circumstances that sometimes are a little difficult and we find the closest broom bush and we start saying to God, I wish I didn't live. And we forget. And yet God in his mercy and grace shows up even with Elijah under the broom tree. He says, what are you doing, Elijah? I have a plan for your life. And God shows up in a powerful way. Although there's fire that comes and there's an earthquake that comes and there's all sorts of powerful occurrences. There's a powerful wind that comes while Elijah's on this broom brush. But the voice of God wasn't in any of those power encounters. Instead, the Lord came in a gentle whisper and spoke to Elijah that day. You see, sometimes in our life circumstances that bring high levels of discouragement, we want God to come in great power. And sometimes he does, but sometimes he comes in the still small voice. Are you listening and stilling yourself enough to hear the whisper of God even in the life circumstances that are difficult? Maybe the third reason why we get discouragement is we get discouraged with God. We get disappointed with God. Jeremiah was also a prophet in the Old Testament who became very discouraged in his ministry. Jeremiah came to a place where he even believed God was against him. And because of that, his perspective is temporary lost, and he loses his hope in God. And you can read it in Lamentations 13, or chapter 3. It's a lament of Jeremiah. He was filled with discouragement to the point where he started to believe that God wasn't for him, but against him. Even in the New Testament, the disciples were discouraged when Jesus was crucified. And they were walking down the Emmaus Road. And they wondered, what was all of that ministry in the life of Jesus? He's gone. He's dead. He's left us. And so the disciples were discouraged after Jesus' death. And in Luke 24, the scriptures say this, But we had hoped that he was the one who was going to redeem Israel. And what is more, it is the third day since all of this took place. And so they're discouraged. And friend, I want you to know, maybe you're here. And you're discouraged, maybe even disappointed with God. I want you to know something. In my life, I've learned this. And I've seen it in the lives of, every, of many people around me. Those setbacks in your life, it's a setback that's setting you up for an even greater comeback. I really believe that. Those things that seem like, man, this is taking the wind out of me. This is a huge setback. Listen, don't lose faith because God's planning the greatest comeback you would have ever thought or imagined. Do you believe that? And so when discouragement comes and you're thinking, how are we going to get out of this? God, that's how. And he's going to leave you awestruck and saying, wow, God, only you can do this. Friends, those setbacks, it's not the end of the story. God is preparing the greatest comeback. And nothing worth doing comes easy. And we've had some setbacks. <laughs> we've been on this journey to develop 1100 Canadian Place. We've had setbacks. But friends, God is, is testing our character. He's building our character. You know, at the end of the day, not only will we have, uh, with God's help, built a church, but we will have built a people. And I wonder if that's what God cares about the most. He's into character development. He wants to build a people. And so with the setbacks, there's developing this movement of comeback. And I really believe that with all of my heart. And we're going to sit in that auditorium one day and we're going to give all praise to God. 
And we're going to be better people, stronger people, more spiritual people, people of faith, because we've gone through the setbacks. Just to normalize some of the setbacks we've gone through. I was talking with another pastor at a conference last week, and, and they're going through the same thing. And, and, and some pastors are now inviting me to their board meetings to try to encourage them. And they've asked me, how long have you been in this process? And I said, well, we're, we're almost there. We're, we're almost there. It's about been three years. And they're like, oh, wow, that's amazingly fast. I said, are you on something? It doesn't feel like it's fast. And they're like, well, we've been in it for five years. And nowhere, we're nowhere close to where you are. You see, so as much as we've experienced some setbacks, friends, God has actually been with us every step of the way. He has been. And sometimes we need some perspective. We need some perspective. It ain't going to take five years. It's just around the corner. That's why we need to pray. But sometimes we're disappointed with God. Friends, he's setting us up for the greatest comeback. Fourth reason maybe that we get discouraged this morning is we're discouraged with ourselves. Do you ever get discouraged with yourself? Do you ever get discouraged about some of the choices that you make that you're not so proud about? Peter felt this way. Here's Peter, one of Jesus' closest disciples. He royally fails. Peter failed Jesus. Even though Jesus even warned him, Peter, you're going to deny me when I need you the most. No, Jesus, what are you talking about? How can I ever do that? And yet, Peter failed, and he felt he failed to live up to his own expectations and the expectations of others. And in that moment, When he was asked, do you know this man? He denies even knowing Jesus three times. After Peter denied knowing Jesus three times, there's this really dark verse there. It says, and he went outside and he wept bitterly. Have you ever gone outside and wept bitterly? Have you ever been so discouraged with yourself that you've been perhaps struggling with a certain area of temptation? And it just seems like it's always there. And it seems like you do okay for a bit. And then, and then you fall in that pit again. And, and you struggle through it. And you try to come into a place like this to worship. And you're like, I can't even lift my hands. I, I can't even lift my voice. I'm discouraged. I feel like I'm unworthy. And perhaps that discouragement causes you to not even go to church anymore. And you're isolating yourself. And you're wandering. Because you're discouraged with yourself. It seems like I just can't overcome. You feel defeated by temptation. Friends, it's in those bitter moments that you need to remember that God wants to redeem you. He wants to transform you. What happened in Peter's life? God reaffirmed him. Jesus reaffirmed him. After he arose from the dead, he reappeared. And who does he want to talk to? First thing, Peter. Peter, I want breakfast with you. Let's, let's have some breakfast. And what does he say, Peter? Do you love me? Yes, Jesus, I love you. Peter, Peter, did you hear me? Do you love me? Yes. Peter, do you love me? Jesus, yes. Yes. Then serve. Then feed my sheep. Then make a difference. You denied me three times, but I'm reaffirming you three times. Peter becomes one of the key leaders in the early church. This man who didn't have enough strength to to say, yes, I know Jesus. He was afraid of the the consequences of that admission. In Acts, you see Peter being the first one who preaches, empowered by the Holy Spirit. This weak man over here has now turned into a courageous, bold man who preaches a sermon where thousands come to know faith. That's the Jesus we serve. He redeems us. He takes us out of those bitter crying moments of failure where we're completely discouraged with myself. And he says, I'm going to make something great out of you. He wants to make something great out of you. He wants to change those bitter moments in your life into sweet moments with him. He wants to use you. Don't disqualify yourself. 
Don't ever disqualify yourself, friend. God's power is greater than your failures. Don't allow yourself to be defined by those bitter failure moments. Don't allow that discouragement towards yourself to hinder you from doing great things for God. Friends, sometimes you need a miracle, don't you? Say, God, I need a breakthrough. But friends, there is no miracle until you need a miracle. And sometimes God brings us to the place Where I really need a miracle, that's when the miracles happen. The hand of God. Some trust in chariots and some in horses. But we, we trust in the name of the Lord our God. And so maybe you walked in here and you're battered and bruised. Maybe even this past week, maybe last night, you made some choices and somehow you dragged yourself here. And you were discouraged. Friends, there's hope for you. There's hope for you. How do we overcome this toxin of discouragement in our life? How do we do this? So we know that where where discouragement can come from, from from our relationships, from, from our life circumstances. Perhaps there's those moments of discouragement with God, disappointments with God, discouragement from ourselves. How do we overcome this toxin? Because if we let it control us, many of us will will be led astray will shipwreck the vision that God has put in our heart. I want to say two things. This is how we overcome discouragement. The one truth is this. God is with you. God is with us. He's Emmanuel. In a couple months, we're going to celebrate this at Christmas. He's the God who is with us. He's not a God who's far off. And he's not a God who's irrelevant. He's not on the fringes of our life. He's not on the fringes of our society. He knows what's going on because he's right in it. He's right in it. And not only is, is, he, is, he, is he all, he's all present. Think about it. He's omniscient. That's in his character. He's all present. Psalm 139 says this, Where can I go from your spirit? Where can I flee from your presence? If I go up to the heavens, you're there. If I make my bed in the depths, guess what? You're there. If I rise on the wings of the dawn, if I settle on the far side of the sea, even there your hand will guide me. Your right hand will hold me fast. Friends, no matter where you go, no matter the life circumstance, no matter the relational tension, no matter the the disappointments, the seeming disappointments, no matter the discouragement with ourselves, God is not absent. He is present. There's not one nanosecond that goes by in your life that God is not there. He's there. His omniscience is like a circle without a circumference. There's no edge to the presence of God. You might not feel him, but trust me, he's there. He sees you. He knows what you're feeling. He knows your discouragement. He's right there with you. I love the story of Jacob. He's running for his life from his brother Esau. He's in the middle of desolation. He's he's wandering in the wilderness. And it's there in this desolate place in the wilderness where he tries to get some shut-eye. And it's when he closes his eyes where he sees a vision. And in Genesis 28, it says, When Jacob awoke from his sleep, he thought, and his vision was his ladder that went from the earth all the way to the heavens. And the angels were ascending and descending with the Lord at, at the top of this ladder. And the point of the vision was that I'm right here. Although you're in the wilderness, although you're running for your life, and your life circumstances are not ideal, I'm right here. And so he wakes up from this vision and he says this, Surely the Lord is in this place. And I was not aware of it. He was afraid and he said this, How awesome is this place. This is none other than the very house of God. This is the gate of heaven. He calls that place Bethel, which is the house of God. Isn't that amazing? God turns desolate wasteland into the very house of God. 
And so you might be in one of those seasons, in the wasteland, in the wilderness. Friends, God is right there and he wants to turn that wilderness into the very house and presence of God. He's right there. God is with you. And sometimes it's that adversity that causes us to mature and grow deeper roots and resiliency in our life. But don't ever forget this truth. He's with you. He'll never leave you. He'll never forsake you. God is with you. The second point of getting rid of the toxin is this. God is for you. So not only is he with you, he's actually for you. He cares about you. He cares about you. Think of those people in your life that you know. You, tragedy can strike your life in the middle of the night, 3 a.m., and you know that you can show up at their door and knock on the door, and they would open it, and they'd sit with you. They'd put on a pot of coffee, and they're going to pray for you. They're going to strengthen you. Do, do you. do you have anybody like that? Maybe it's a family member. It's your spouse, a friend, a brother, a sister. Think of that person that you know you can count on. They've they've proved it to you over and over again in your life. God is for you. He's like that. He will go through the storm with you. He's not against you. He's for you. Think about this. The scriptures say in the gospel of Matthew in chapter 10, Are not two sparrows sold for a penny? Yet not one of them will fall to the ground outside your father's care. And even the very hairs of your head are all numbered. So don't be afraid. You are worth more than many sparrows. What is the scripture teaching us? If I take care of the birds of the air, don't you think I'm going to take care of you? The apex of my creation, I will not allow you to fall. Why? Because I'm for you. I care for you. I love Romans 8. And get this in your heart. If God is for us, who can be against us? He's for you. Friends, I asked a teenager once this question. I said, what do you think God thinks of you? And he says, I think he hates me. I think he hates my guts. And I said, why do you say that? Well, because I've done this, I've done that, this is what I've been a part of, and, and it couldn't be further from the truth. God is for us, not against us. And if God is for us, who can ever defeat us? The God of the universe, the one who puts the sparrows in the air, the one who flings the stars in the black velvet sky, he's not only for you, he's actually in you. He lives inside of you by his Holy Spirit. You're the temple of the Holy Spirit. And so when you're feeling discouragement, remember this, he's with you and he's also for you because he cares for you. He actually has a plan for us. God has a plan for us. 1 Peter 2.9 says this, but you are a chosen people a royal priesthood, a holy nation, God's special possessions, that you may declare the praises of him who called you out of the darkness into the wonderful light. You might not feel like a special possession. You might not feel like a gem, but trust me, you are. You might feel like filthy rags, But God takes those filthy rags and he puts robes of righteousness over you because he has a purpose and a plan. He chose you. He knows you by name. He knit you together in your mother's womb. You are his workmanship. In fact, Ephesians 2.10 says that you're his handiwork. For we are God's handiwork created in Christ Jesus to do good works, which God prepared in advance for us to do. God has a destiny for your life. I tell you, Sylvia and I have been, our hearts have been leaping since we've been spending a little bit more time with our young adults. And last night we met with them. There was almost 30 of us. Young adults, if you didn't come, you need to come in the next table talk in the month of November. And I'll hunt you down. And I will invite you 
Because you know what? You matter to me and you matter to this church. And there's too many young adults who have forgotten this truth. That God actually, they're, the, they're God's handiwork. That he has put personality in you, gifts in you, talents in you to do great things for him. You have a purpose over your life. And sometimes what discouragement does is it saps all the purpose out of us. It makes us think, I'm, I'm just nobody. Nobody cares for me. I don't have any special talent. Look at them. They have the talent. I don't have the talent. And the couldn't be further from the truth. Not only is God with you, he's for you. And if you've got God for you, who could come against you, friend? I conclude with these thoughts. Worship team, if you come, we'd love for you to serve us at the conclusion of this gathering. I've been thinking, and uh, every time in the fall as the year comes to uh, a conclusion, I, I like to reflect on God's goodness and all that happened in the year that was. And, and, I, and I began to think through. I, I keep a uh, record of uh, different visits I make for those in hospital or in need and I keep record of funerals that I've participated in. And the reason why I do that is because I, I want you to know that, that you matter to me. That as your pastor, I continue to pray for you. And I want God's best over your life. But you know, there's been a lot of moments in many of your lives where we've wept together through times of tragedy and discouragement. I think of two families who who lost babies. And I had to, I remember Neil literally in the dirt holding a casket that held a little baby. I did that twice. And it ripped my heart out. And as a leader, you're trying to stay strong for the family and you weep with them, but then you get in the car and you just break down. Because you're like, God, help them. And you know, I think of these two families and God carried them through their tragedy. And today they have families. Today they've moved on. Today they've, they've remembered this child that God gave to them for a brief time. God led them through the fire and through the river, but they came back out on the other side. God has a plan. There have been moments where I've literally had funeral directors tell me, can you peel the family off the casket because we have to close it? I got to tell you, that's one of the hardest things that I have to do as a pastor to literally push people away from their grief so that door can close. And yet I've seen those same people. I've seen God turn their mourning into dancing. Because our God is a God who brings us through those seasons of discouragement into seasons of great joy and redemption. I've cried with some of you who've had family members deal with mental health issues and challenges at the extreme levels. Some of you have lost loved ones because of mental health challenges. And yet God has been doing a deep work in your life and he's brought you through. I've cried with some of you related to the brokenness that's come in your marriages. Some have dissipated. But yet you're here. And God is healing and God is restoring. Some of you have been through the shipwrecks of relationships. And yet you're here because God is with you and he's for you. This morning, God is right here, right now. He's with us because he's Emmanuel. And he wants to strengthen you even amidst your discouragement. The discouragement related to your relationships. The discouragement related to those life circumstances. Those discouragements related to you're disappointed. Or you're discouraged with yourself. Today God wants to lift the discouragement crop. And he says, hey, I'm right here. And I'm for you. I haven't abandoned you. And I never will.